This week in our Little Lambs Preschool Chapel, we began reading the story of Moses. And the story of Moses, you might remember, begins with the story of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And this king, this mighty ruler, is afraid. Ironically, what he's afraid of are the Hebrews, these people who have no power and no standing. He's afraid of them because of how numerous they've become. And he worries that if they wanted, they could overthrow him and take his power away from him. So what does he do? Well, of course, he strikes first. He makes them all slaves. And then he takes away their children. And this, of course, makes the Hebrews afraid of Pharaoh. And so as the story Bible summarizes, Pharaoh is afraid, and the Hebrews are afraid, and everybody in all of Egypt is afraid. I think about that today because it sounds an awful lot to me like the moment in which we find ourselves now. Everybody is afraid. We're afraid of many things. We're afraid of the pandemic, the changing policies that we believe either keep us safe or keep us scared. We're afraid of the growing growing climate crisis. We're afraid of the power wielded by certain groups or people within our society. Russia is afraid of security risk posed by Ukraine, and Ukraine, of course, is afraid of the Russian troops invading their country. And we are all afraid of where this might lead us. In Luke's story today, I think that Herod is afraid, too. I think that's why he wants to kill Jesus. Not unlike Pharaoh, I think he is afraid that his power or his authority or his reputation or something important to him is on the line, that it could be taken from him. And so he wants to strike first before it happens. He's grasping at what he has. He wants to hold on to it, whatever it takes, even if it takes murder. And it makes me wonder In a time of so much fear, are we holding on more tightly too? What are we grasping at these days? To what lengths would we be willing to go to protect those things? I find myself wondering whether it's the fear that makes us hold on to things like our rights and our national identities and our status and our wealth, or whether it's holding on to those things that makes us fearful. Unlike Herod and Pharaoh and the Hebrews and all of us, there is one person today who doesn't seem to be afraid, and that's Jesus. When the Pharisees warn him to run away, he does not. Instead, he continues on his way, continues doing the work he's been given to do, work that he knows and says will take him straight to Jerusalem, where he fully expects to be welcomed just as the prophets before him have been welcomed. And yet he remains unafraid. Why is that? Do you think maybe Jesus knows something we don't? Earlier in his letter to the Philippians, Paul quotes this hymn to explain this mystery that keeps Jesus unafraid. Maybe you've have heard it. Maybe you know it. Though he was born in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped and held tightly, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human form. And being found in human form, he humbled himself further and became obedient, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus willingly gave up more than Herod or Pharaoh ever had. 
He emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, making himself obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. And because he gives it up freely, it can't be taken from him. He has no fear of losing it. Paul urges his readers today to follow this example, to escape the grip of fear by letting go, by emptying themselves. He, he encourages them to join in imitating him. What he actually says is, be co-imitators, either of Paul himself, who is an imitator of Christ, or with Paul to be an imitator of Christ. Either way, the thrust is the same. He wants them, he wants us, to join together in being co-imitators of Christ and to escape this cycle of fear and grasping and losing. That's what it means to call Jesus Lord, as in the hymn. It means to follow where he leads. And we remember today that where he leads us is the cross. When we try to hold on to what we have, like Herod, we end up worshiping something besides God. We end up worshiping, as Paul says, our bellies, our earthly desires. It's natural that we should want and cry out for stability, especially in uncertain days like these. We want what is stable and familiar. And that's good, but by itself, that means stagnation. In order to thrive, in order to grow, we need old balanced with new. Creation balanced with destruction, life balanced with death. We need a world that isn't static, but that's dynamic. One that's not stuck where it is, but is always moving forward. When we get what we think we want, we may be full for a while, but the end is always the same. All these earthly things pass away, and in the end, we're left with nothing. Paradoxically, what Paul reminds us today is that to let go as Christ does is to find true fulfillment. The truth to which Jesus testifies with his entire life is that all these things, both order and disorder, Creation and destruction, life and death, all of them are working together for the health of the whole creation. They are, in some sense, all the same thing. Different sides of the same coin. All life is marked with death. As we grow from children to adults, as we mature from youth to old age, we are constantly letting go. We let go of childish ways and thoughts as we become wiser. We let go of immaturity and innocence as we grow in understanding and responsibility. We let go of the myriad possibilities of youth as we make choices throughout our lives. We let go of youth. We let go of ability, of health, of agency. And finally, we let go of life itself. All of life is a process of emptying which prepares us for the greatest emptying of all. When we enter, empty our very selves into God's self and return to our source and become one again with God, our Father, and our mother, and our family. This is the truth to which Jesus testifies, that this emptying actually fills us. Now, that doesn't mean that letting go is easy or pleasant. It's hard work, and it's marked with sorrow and loss and pain, but also potentially with freedom and joy and relief. I don't think that Paul is asking us today not to be afraid or angry or sad, but simply not to let those emotions be the ones that guide us. Jesus wasn't driven by anger or fear or sadness, but by love. That love is what allowed him to empty himself, why he was able to experience the greater glory that God had in store. Right now, I know that we as a congregation are dealing with a lot of fear 
and anxiety. Not just about what's happening in the world around us, but about the health and the future of this community. I've heard us voice fears about losing members. I've seen us get angry and agitated talking about how best to manage our budget. Shrinking men membership, shrinking uh, ministry, an inability to gather for worship or fellowship the only way we know how. Now a reduction of our staff. Even our very sense of what we think of as normal. All these things we've had to give up. And we're so afraid of what more we might be asked to give up before we fall apart. I wonder if we feel powerless. Powerless in the midst of pandemic, with rules that seem to keep changing. Powerless to turn the tide of a diminishing church attendance over the last half century. I wonder if we're feeling weak and vulnerable. I wonder if we feel like somehow we're, being, we're failing at what we've been called to do. What I hear in this story today is that being in this place of weakness and failure is what tempts us to grasp at something more. To claw back what we once had or to try to wrestle something more from life. And I hear that this temptation will only lead us to destruction as surely as throwing oneself from the pinnacle of the temple. But I also hear that it is in this lowly place, this place of weakness and failure, this body of humiliation, that Christ comes among us. As hard as it may be to believe, this is what he chose, what he chooses. Paul reminds us today that it is this body of humiliation, this emptied, battered, and bruised community that is being transformed by the power of Christ until it is conformed to the body of his glory. And that power we hear today is the power to let go. Who we are now in all our brokenness, our shrinking our aging, our dying, that is not something to be ashamed of or to be sorry for. It is the necessary raw material for the new creation that God is bringing into existence in and among us even now, even if we can't perceive it. I think it's okay. I think it's healthy for us to acknowledge and to mourn these things together that we've had to let go of. These things and these people that we've lost. Because as a congregation, we're called to, bury, to, to bear our burdens together, to share our sorrow and our anger and our frustration with one another. But we're also called to support each other in imitating Christ by emptying ourselves in preparation to receive the new thing that God is doing. And that's why Paul says just a few verses later, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. It's not that this work of emptying, of dying, isn't hard. It's that in Christ, being emptied is also somehow mysteriously being filled. Paul writes in this letter from prison. He's given up everything for the sake of this good news. And he, get, he did so gladly because he knew that the very thing, the very message that put him in prison is the message that gives his friends in Philippi hope. It's the message that allows them to know Christ. And as Paul has said just a few verses before this, that is the most important thing for him. The thing for which he's willing to give up everything else. Even having been emptied of everything, Paul finds himself sitting in prison, somehow full. In this season of grief and loss, I find myself pondering what more we might be called to let go of. What good things might we be invited to lay aside as we run this race? 
What healthy, beneficial things are we invited to count as loss next to the all-surpassing value of knowing Christ and being found in him? As we consider where God is in this moment, it's worth considering that maybe this time, this experience of emptying, might in itself be a deliverance. What if this is our season of dying before being reborn?